Good morning. Oh. Got to be on. There we go. Good morning. morning. We want to welcome you to Cedar Crest Bible Fellowship Church, where it is our mission and our goal and our ambition to glorify the triune God by exalting Him, edifying and equipping His church, and evangelizing the world with His gospel. We love Jesus and we want to see Jesus magnified. We want to see sinners turn from their sin and come to trust in Jesus and his followers follow him more faithfully. I made that up. That's pretty good. Um, I'm just kidding. If you are a guest with us, uh, we want to invite you to fill out a Connect card, which is in the pew back in front of you, or you can do so on our website at cedarcrest.church. But in person is always better because we have a, a welcome center through these doors in the lobby. We want a chance to get to meet you, get to know you, you to get to know us a little bit, and we have a gift for you. So please um, go do that. It, you know, if you've already received like three gifts, that's probably enough, all right? If, uh, if you are a believer here in our church and you've, and you've been attending and you are trusting in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins, uh, we are encouraging you to take that next step of baptism, all right? And uh, our next baptism Sunday is going to be on Easter Sunday. All right, and uh, this baptism is for adults. If, if you have uh, a son or a daughter in your house who wants to be baptized, the next one for them is the summer, only because we have a discipleship process that we want all of our young people to go through in order to do that. So you can see Pastor Jules for any questions with regard to that. But uh, it, the next baptism for adults is on Easter Sunday. And if you're interested in going through this process, please apply at cedarcrest.church forward slash membership. All right. The uh, deadline is going to be on February 21st, so please make sure not to miss that. The Apologetics Conference, you've heard us talk about this a lot. We are just absolutely floored. We have doubled our goal. We're, uh, we're, we're approaching 400 people signed up. Glory be to God for that. So I have a few comments I want to make about that. First, uh, because of capacity, uh, particularly in our gym, to feed all of those people and you guys who are going to come on out, we, we have to end sign-ups tomorrow. So if you have not signed up, tomorrow is your last day to do so. So please uh, make sure to do that and go to cedarcrest.church forward slash EBC, which stands for Every Believer Confident. The other thing I want to say about that is this. When we were at about 160, 170 sign-ups, Lauren Skinker told me we had at least a dozen other churches represented. I can imagine our own. If you're a member of our church, you attend here regularly and you're coming, have the posture of welcoming guests to our facilities. If you see someone who looks lost, maybe try to help them, ask them where they're trying to get to. And also, we actually are looking for some people to volunteer to help us out with some things. No volunteer job will take you away from more than 20 or 30 minutes of any session of the day. All right, we have various different ways you can volunteer from helping prep lunch about 30 minutes prior to helping with registration um, and to also helping uh, Mark Farnham, our main speaker, at his book table. So we're going to have sign-ups on the same webpage tomorrow as well, so please be looking for that, okay? Uh, and then Fresh Encounter. One of our uh, core values here at Cedar Crest is prayer. We are totally dependent on God to do everything, and so we want to intercede, and we want to worship, and we want to pray to our God. So we're having a fresh encounter here at the church after uh, the service on Sunday, March 10th. All right, we're inviting you to pack your own lunch or to fast, whichever you prefer, and we will eat in the gym, and then we'll head on over to the chapel for that fresh encounter. So mark your, mark your calendars for March 10th, uh, right after the service, lunch, and then prayer at noon in the chapel. All right, this Sunday is Membership Sunday. The Church Universal, which is every believer who has ever lived or will live, is dear to our Lord's heart. He loves his church. Ephesians 5, uh, 25 through 27 tells us that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Are we waiting for that day? And he also nourishes and cherishes his church because we are members of his body. Well, this same Lord who loves all of his people wants his church, every single member that he died for, to grow in holiness, in love, in purity, in zeal, in knowledge, and much more. How does he do this? Well, he commands all of his people who are locked...
All right, and as they head back to their seats, I'll invite the rest of you to stand if you're able to begin our time of worship and song. I'm going to read uh, for us from Joel chapter 2. It says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why don't we just take a moment this morning of silence and just reflect on the fact that the God of the universe who has created you and everything you know and everything you love and who is sovereign over everything has invited you, invited us together to return to him, to return to a God who is slow to anger, gracious, and abounding in steadfast love. Let's just take a minute to recognize what we're doing and reflect on that invitation.
the scriptures say, uh, I think it's in one of the Psalms, that it's, it's good. It benefits us to go to the house of mourning, to recognize that life is short and there, there's value in being solemn and taking moments like that. But we're Christians, right? And we know that things aren't always going to be difficult. Things won't always be hard. And so we also want to praise our God greatly. The scriptures say that uh, our God is great and greatly to be praised. And so we're going to start things off a little bit upbeat this morning. Feel free to, to clap and, and sing out as we worship our God together. He has called us out. You have called us out of darkest night into your glorious light that we may sing the wonders of the risen Christ. May our every breath retell the grace that broke into our stride with boundless love and Deepest joy with endless light. May the people's praise you. Let the nations be glad. All your blessing comes that we may praise. May praise the name of yours and all with each harvest is your own and from your hands we give to you to make christ known may the seeds of mercy grow in us for those who have not heard may songs of praise fill lives of grace to Spread your word. May the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad. All your blessing comes that we may praise. May praise the name of Jesus. It's a holy privilege to declare your praises and your name to every nation, tribe, and tongue, your church proclaim. May the peoples praise you, let the nations be glad, all your blessing comes that we from 
John. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. Christians, the one who has bathed, the one who's been bathed with the grace of God and is trusted in the blood of Jesus is completely clean. And so we may stumble into sin, and we may feel all that, that shame and guilt again, but Jesus says, I don't need to wash you all over again. I just need to wash your feet. Just come to me. Just ask for forgiveness. And we know that There is no condemnation. There's no shame. There's no guilt. God doesn't look at you and think, ugh, I can't believe you did that. He looks at you and he says, son, daughter, let me pick you up. Let me help you. Let me love you. That's our God. And so we rejoice in that finality. No one takes your salvation from you. No one. So we rest in the rock of ages and we rejoice. Let's continue to sing. Did what I could. 
As we go to the Lord in prayer, I want to read to you Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all people. For great is his steadfast love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Join me in prayer. Lord, we have countless reasons to praise you. And as the psalm reminds us, we praise you for great is your steadfast love towards us. You have not left sinners alone in their guilt, in their judgment, in their condemnation, but your love is towards them. This is seen in so many ways, but most directly in the fact that you've sent your son that you have made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might be the righteousness of God in him. And yet there are many who continue to struggle to know your love for them is steadfast. That even when we fail and give in to temptation, that you will not leave us nor forsake us. Father, I pray that everyone in this room would know your steadfast love, that we would have confidence that he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ, that we would know, as Psalm 117 says, the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. We praise you for your faithfulness to us, for never leaving us alone, for never forsaking us, for keeping your promises. Father, your faithfulness endures forever, so we praise you. We also see, Father, that this psalm is a call to praise you, a a call to praise you from the nations. And so, Father, we want to pray for our witness. We thank you that there are many here who are faithful to bring the gospel to their co-workers, to their neighbors, to their families, to their friends. I thank you for this church, that it is a church who cares about missions and evangelism. But Father, we also want to take the time for confession. We want to repent for the sin of silence, for when we know that we should share, but we do not. And Father, we repent 
for if we have ever overlooked someone, if we have ever thought someone was too far gone or too much of a sinner to share the good news with them, Father, may we never have this attitude. Father, may we be faithful in our witness. Help us, we pray. We ask that you would use us to bring the gospel to the nations. We think of the upcoming missions trips to Italy, to Ukraine, and to the youth going to central Pennsylvania. We pray for the formation of these teams and all the preparation as they get ready to go. We pray that you would that they would already be, uh, that you would be preparing their hearts of the individuals that these teams will come in contact with. Prepare the hearts of the teams as well. Get ready, help them to get ready for the trip and to share the gospel. We also want to pray for the outreach person of the week, the Dobrowskis. We pray for their work at City Light in Allentown. We pray that you would bless their ministry to the homeless. We pray that you would provide for their financial needs in matching building renovation grant. And finally, Father, we want to continue to pray for the outreach pastor position. Father, help us to find the right man that will continue to lead this church in our mission and keep us on task. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to dismiss the kids, and as they leave, I'm going to invite Jason up to pray over him as well. Let's continue in prayer. Father, I lift up my brother Jason to you, and Father, I ask that you would fill him with your spirit, use him in a mighty way this morning, speak through him. Father, I know as he's been struggling with some sickness, Lord, that I just ask that you would give him the energy he needs. Father, keep back the evil one from him and from us. I pray as the congregation, Lord, we would have hearts and ears open to receive the truth of your word, that we would hear it, that we would apply it to our lives, and that we'd live for your glory. So, Father, fill him with your spirit and speak through him this morning, Lord. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you, brother. One of you mentioned to me last week that the Lord is doing so many wonderful things here that it sure seems like the devil's afoot. And he is. He is. And I feel it personally, dealing with a bronchial thing that's going on, and my family's been hit hard, and got a sty in my eye, and on and on and on. But guess what? The Lord Jesus is sovereign over the devil. So this morning, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9, where my prayer has been, we really want to see the Lord Jesus for who He is, His heart for sinners. And I want to begin this morning by giving you a parable that I kind of came up with to Give us the feel of what's going on in this text. So here we go. There's two different men who went to the doctor because they were both having symptoms of a certain type of cancer. And so as you listen to this, I want you to listen for the different responses they had to their sickness. The first man went, got some further tests, confirmed that he had stage 4 cancer. But, like any good patient would do, he went and he got a second opinion from another doctor. Gave him the same news. And so this man actually received the advice and the news and the diagnosis from the two doctors. And he set up treatments that he he had to have if he was going to kill this cancer and receive healing. The second man, though, he didn't believe the doctor. He also went, he got a second opinion. That doctor said the same thing, told him he had stage four lung cancer. And yet the man would not believe that doctor either. Why? Because he felt okay. Actually went and got a third opinion, got the same exact news. 
And yet he would not believe any of them because he did not see the cancer on the outside, nor did he feel the effects of it yet in his body. And so that meant he didn't seek treatment. He didn't seek treatment for his cancer and thus get healed. And so you ask, what's the difference between the two men? Well, you know the difference. One man knew that he was sick. He knew that he was sick and he needed healing. When another man, he didn't believe he was sick when he was sick. And so he never sought the treatment. And thus, he didn't get healing. And you probably know where I'm going with this. The same thing can happen spiritually. Listen to the difference between these two men when it came to spiritual sickness and spiritual healing. This is Jesus' parable, Luke 18. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. And yet the tax collector, standing far off, will not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You see, the one man knew that he was sick. The other man didn't know that he was sick. Why? Because he did a bunch of religious rituals that made him think he was right and holy before God, neglecting his sickness on the inside. And what is that sickness? That sickness is the sickness of sin that has affected every single human being that has ever walked on this planet, save one, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, sin has come into the world through one man, meaning Adam in the Garden of Eden. Sin came into the world through that man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. That's Romans chapter 5. And the last time I checked, every single human being has either died or will die, save the few that were taken up in a cloud. That would be kind of cool. Or the Lord Jesus who was raised. Do you know what that means? We've all been infected. We're all sick. Every single one of us in this room is sick with sin. The Bible says no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. All have turned aside and have become worthless. No one does good, not even one, in God's eyes, spiritually speaking, holy, pure, doing everything for the glory of God. There is not one. Jesus has told us that we are sick when he said, out of men's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, envy, slander, pride, lust, ungodly anger. Gang, that's all of us guilty. We've all committed those sins. We are guilty. We are separated from a holy God who can't have sin even near him. Sin deserves to be punished. He's not holy otherwise. And yet God, in his infinite mercy and kindness, even before the foundation of the world, had a plan with his dear son, before they made anything, that he would send him into the world to be the great physician who would heal us of our spiritual sickness. Hallelujah. Praise him. You have to realize something first, though. And I'm going to ask you now, do you believe that you're sick? I ask you that because if you don't believe that you're sick, you're not going to seek the Savior. 
you're sick. And so I'm going to encourage you this morning to seek the Savior who wants to heal you. He wants to save you. It's the main point of our text this morning. Jesus Christ left heaven's glory and he came into the world to save sinners. To save sinners. Those who know they are sick, like the tax collector who beat on his breast. People like one person quoted some wonderful preachers of old who, who knew their sickness. John Knox once said this, one of the greatest preachers in Scottish history. He said, in my youth, in my middle age, and now after many battles, I find nothing in me but corruption. John Wesley, listen to his words. I am fallen short of the glory of God. My whole heart is altogether corrupt. It's abominable. My whole life. From the flesh, being an evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit. I'm sick. I'm sick with sin. And then I thought of Peter, people in the Bible like Peter when he beheld the glory of the Lord Jesus after the miraculous catch of fish. Do you remember what he said when he saw the holiness of the Lord Jesus? Do you remember what he said? Depart from me. I am a sinful man. Sinful man. And then we hear the apostle Paul when he was saw, call himself the chief of sinners. Jesus was sent into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the foremost, the chief. These people knew they were sick. They were separated from a holy God. And unless you understand this, you won't need a Savior. And so we're about to meet a man, this is wonderful, who's sick. He's sick with sin. And he needs a Savior. And he wants a Savior. And there's a bunch of other people who are in the same boat as him. And we're going we're gonna to check them out. But we're not really, really told what they're thinking. What they're feeling. But that's not the point. I'm going to tell you. Now we're going to meet a bunch of people who don't think they're sick. They don't think they're sick with sin. And they can't fathom why this rabbi would ever associate with sinners instead of them. So first, let's meet this man who's actually the author of this gospel, Matthew. He realizes that he's a sinner before God, and he leaves everything to follow Jesus. Isn't this interesting, gang? A lot of people brought this out. Isn't this interesting that this follows the account of the paralytic and Jesus saying to the paralytic, son, take heart your sins are forgiven. Matthew's about to tell us, I'm another son whom he's forgiven. Look at verse 9. Jesus calls another sinner. He passed on from there. He saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. And he said to him, follow me. This is chapter 9, verse 9. Nine. And look at what he does. He rose and followed. Now, I know you're probably going to have a lot of questions. So let's dive in here. Matthew, he, he gives us one short verse about his own call to discipleship. I think part of that is the humble man that he is. But he only tells us a couple of things. He notes that Jesus passed on from there, he says, meaning from the last scene where we were just at last week with the crowds, the Pharisees, the paralytic that he just forgave and healed. And now I picture, he passed on from there. What's he doing? Jesus is on the hunt. He's a shepherd. He's a shepherd. He's looking for his sheep. That's what I see when I, when I see these words that Matthew writes. Jesus saw a man. He saw a man. And I want you to feel this, brothers and sisters, because in your conversion, he saw you personally. I don't want you to ever forget that these are real, actual events. This happened. Matthew's a flesh and blood human being. Jesus became flesh and blood human being who is on the hunt to look for his sheep, to save his sheep. This was not a casual glance and then he walks off. No, he was looking for Matthew. He's looking for Matthew. And then Matthew tells us the only thing he wants us to know about himself. 
before Jesus calls him to discipleship. And this is huge. Look at what he says again. Sitting at the tax collector's booth. You know what that makes him, right? Tax collector. A tax collector. One of the most despised people on the planet at that time. You think IRS gets a bad rap. Listen, this was a million times worse. Matthew was a Jew who served the Roman Empire. He ruled over the Jewish nation at that time. Tax collectors would funnel the money they collected to the empire and the armies of Rome according to the historians. So here's what they would do. They would collect what the Romans taxed you on, which was pretty much everything. General taxes on your land and your income to your boat and docking your boat and your fish, if you're a fisherman, to the crops that you harvested as a farmer, to various articles of clothing in your household, and even an activity that you wanted to do. They taxed almost everything. One historian said they would tax a traveler's donkey and his slaves and the goods that he brought with them. It's crazy. Gets worse. One historian said the tax collectors had the right to assess the value of your stuff. You know what that means, right? Your stuff's worth $200. It's worth 10 bucks. That meant you had to pay higher taxes. They do this all the time. And Rome did not, they did not care. Rome did not care. They just wanted what they asked of you to give to them on the tax, everything else above and beyond. You can skim off the top and you can keep. So, tax collectors were filthy rich. And they were filthy rich off the backs of their people. They were despised for this. They were called thieves. They were called traitors. They were even banned from the synagogue because they associated with Roman Gentiles. One preacher said tax collectors were unacceptable politically unacceptable religiously, and unacceptable socially. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to, you do this when you read the Bible, you try to get into this and, all right, tax collectors. I try to love my IRS workers. I don't think they're as bad as that dude, but who would I see? Who would I see is vile, despicable? Who would it be for you, gang? Murderer, adulterer, homosexual, trans, drunkard, who would it be? And what would you do compared to what Jesus does next? He walked up to this man, and he saw this man, one of the most despicable men in town. And he said, follow me. This is our Savior. This is the heart of our God. He has come to seek and to save the lost. He says to Matthew, follow me. Just like he did to James and John and Peter and Andrew. Follow me. This is a call to discipleship. That's what this means. Leave your corrupt tax collecting behind and come follow me. Literally means get behind me and line up your life with me. In other words, I call this repentance and faith. Repent of your sinful lifestyle. Change your mind about that and turn and come and follow me. Trust me. This is Matthew's conversion. Isn't this cool? We love testimonies, don't we? Conversion stories. Now, you might say, how do you know that, Pastor? Matthew doesn't say anything about repenting or believing. I'm pretty sure that Matthew has heard about this great teacher who's been around in the same town. 
doing incredible miracles. Not to mention what he just said to the paralytic after the paralytic got up and walked home. Son, your sins are forgiven. So I'm thinking, I'm also reformed. The father's drawing his sheep. He's opening his heart to be ready for Jesus. No one can come to me unless the father draws him, Jesus said in John 64, 644. And the father's working on Matthew. He's convicting him. He's opening his heart. He's seeing his sin for what it really is. And he's primed. He's primed to repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I believe he comes under the conviction of sin. He's ready to be forgiven. I mean, think about where this is in Matthew's collection of things. This is right after the whole thing with the paralytic and his sins being forgiven. Matthew is telling us that he is despised, tax collector. And then right here in the text, you see, he got up and he followed him. It's conversion. It's conversion. This is awesome. I'm changing my mind. I don't want this anymore. I want him. I'm going after him. Do you remember when you were converted? I remember when I was converted. I've told you this a number of times. Some of you are new. I was driving in my Jeep Wrangler. I loved that thing. Living a sinful lifestyle. Grew up in the church and didn't give a rip about God. Full-fledged in sin, all kinds of sin. But I knew, I knew it after Jennifer shared the gospel with me that it was the Lord drawing me. He was drawing me. He's working on me. And I was sick and tired of my sin, and I was empty. And I remember saying these words in my Jeep driving to Emmaus. I need to follow you. I remember those words. I need to follow you. And the scales fell from my eyes. Given a heart of flesh, and my life radically changed. Radically changed. That's conversion. That's repentance and faith. And man... I look back at that event and I think, I'd do it all over again. Wouldn't you folks? I'm thinking that's what Matthew's thinking. As he's writing this down, I'd do it all over again. Even though people might think on oh, my word. Dude, lucrative job. You could probably pay for anything you want. He'd say, it's not worth it. Jesus is so much better. I mean, think about everything he's leaving, gang. He could buy anything he wanted to. He would never get a tax collecting job ever again if he would follow Jesus for a couple of weeks. The Romans would never have that. Nor, think about this, if you were Jew in town, you knew that dude was a tax collector, are you going to hire him? Matthew left everything to follow Jesus. This is truly, truly a moment in his life. I'm wonder, do you wonder as he's writing this down, if it brings a smile to his face, tears to his eyes, as he remembers the loving look of the Savior Jesus to him personally, saying, follow me, follow me. <sighs> One person said, Matthew, lost a comfortable job, but he found a destiny. He lost a good income, but he found honor. He lost a comfortable security, but he found an adventure the like of which he had never dreamed. He left a whole way of life to follow Jesus. But I could hear Matthew high-fiving, amening the Apostle Paul, who said, whatever I've counted as loss, I count as a loss for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I don't know if you remember when you were converted. I remember when I was converted. I know I'm going to date myself, but I got rid of all those raunchy CDs. You remember that kind of stuff? I got rid of all that. Nights out at the bar, treating people like toys, cursing, slandering. Man, I love conversion. I'm so thankful for God. So thankful for God. He's did in my life, and I'm sure you are too. He brought us from darkness to light death to life. This is what God does, and this is why he came. I love the poem from Car Amy Carmichael. John MacArthur quoted this. 
Here's what she wrote. I heard him call, come follow, that was all. My gold grew dim, my heart went after him. I rose and followed, that was all. Would you not follow if you heard him call? I pray he's calling any unsaved soul in this room right now. Come, follow me. Follow me. Matthew did. Matthew did. And gang, he wasn't sad about this. He was not sad about this because salvation has reached this house today. That came to my mind. You remember what he said to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was not sad when he brought Jesus home. And he said, he said to Jesus, I'll give up to half my goods. I don't need this stuff anymore. I'll give it away if I've wronged anybody. I have Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the divine Savior. I have him. I have everything I need. That's Matthew. Matthew throws a big party now. He doesn't tell us that, but Mark does. He throws a banquet And it seems like he invites all the other sinners in town to this banquet to meet the Lord Jesus. And again, I just see our Lord Jesus pursuing, going after. He is a shepherd who is going after his sheep. But you're going to notice two kinds of people in this story. Those, at least we pray and hope, we're not told, who think they're sick and need a Savior. And those who are not, they don't think they're sick. They actually accuse Jesus of accepting their sin and approving of it. Look at this, verses 10 through 13. We're going to move through this. As Jesus reclined at the table in his house, in the house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When he heard it, He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So here's the first thing we notice. Jesus is willing to welcome and love on and even associate with the most despicable sinners in town. Or as we like to say, Jesus is showing us that he is a friend of sinners. He's a friend of sinners. Look at verse 10. As Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Now, one person made this note, and they're absolutely right. If Jesus was teaching If this was out in public, the Pharisees, they wouldn't have gotten bent out of shape. They wouldn't have cared about that. But Matthew doesn't tell us that. It says that he was reclining with them at the table in the house, and you know what that means? They are having a meal together. That meant fellowship. That meant accepting them into his life. That meant actually loving them. And who's them? It's the tax collectors and the sinners. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? That's how the Pharisees would have felt. Thieves, traitors, murderers, adulterers, drunkards, prostitutes, all the ungodly people in town. Probably never darkened the door of a synagogue recently. They're they're there. They're eating and fellowshipping with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't think it's just the vile sinners or the tax collectors. I think this is probably anybody who did not follow the Mosaic law or the rabbinic tradition. They were called sinners. They're all sinners. And so you can picture this, right? Do you picture it? Jesus. Jesus sitting there having a meal with tax collectors and adulterers, and prostitutes, and drunkards. Somebody said this, and they're probably right. This is probably where Jesus got that reputation with the Pharisees who called him a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. We see that in Matthew eleven nineteen. 19. Now, people were talking about this. What, what brought them there? 
Right? Do you ever think about that? We're not told that, but what brought them there? Why did they come? Did they hear about all the miracles that he was doing? Did they notice the kindness that Jesus had towards sinners? Did they just hear about the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven. Or did they know Matthew and how despised he was? And Jesus called him to follow, so maybe there's hope for us. I don't know. That's not the point that Matthew's making. Not in this text. The point that he's making is not that they were willing to come and eat with Jesus, but that Jesus was willing to eat with them. That's the point. And it was unthinkable. Unthinkable to the holier-than-thou Pharisees because in their eyes, this was an indication that he was okay with their sinful life. And friends, that is dead wrong. It's dead wrong. Wrong. Please get Jesus correctly. People still use this text today that says Jesus is totally okay with everybody's sinful life, just welcomes them into his wide open arms and approves of their sin without any demand on them to repent and turn to him. It's not true. He welcomes them Absolutely. He loves them. Absolutely. But he's not approving of their sinful lives. He came to save them from it. That's the gospel. And the people that don't get that don't understand Jesus. They don't know who he really is and they don't understand the gospel. That saves sinners and radically transforms them. And so now they're going to charge him with being a friend who approves sin. Look at what they say in verse 11. When the Pharisees saw this, they, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? I mean, in their minds, think about this. How, how dare he? He's a rabbi. He is a rabbi. He's a holy man. And maybe they were thinking in their minds, Man, we heard him preach. Sermon on the Mount. He talked about holiness. My goodness, he, he went even deeper than murder and adultery to lust and anger. This, this doesn't make sense. What hypocrisy. I mean, the Pharisees, uh, you think about this, they didn't even ask the Lord Jesus. They asked his disciples. So I'm wondering if in, in their minds, they, they can't even approach Jesus. Right? They're going to get what? Defiled. Defiled. One person said they probably cornered the disciples outside the house. Asked them this question. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And brothers and sisters, don't read this to mean that they really wanted a biblical answer. They wanted to accuse him. They are accusing him of being a friend of sinners and approving of their sinful ways. In their minds, I truly believe that they think Jesus should be preaching and condemning them right now. He's a rabbi. He should be preaching the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not murder, shall not commit adultery. So in their minds, it's not okay to eat with them first and then preach. You preach right away. And that preaching includes right away condemnation. That's the MO of a legalist. Condemnation right away. It's the same reason why the Pharisee couldn't believe when Jesus allowed the sinful woman to anoint his feet. Do you remember that? Expensive ointment, rub his feet with her hair. If this man were a prophet, he wouldn't know what kind of woman this is. An immoral woman of the worst sort. If he would have known this, he would never let her do this and defile himself and ruin his reputation as a holy rabbi. He totally missed it. They totally miss it. They totally miss the mission of the Lord Jesus. He came to save sinners. I mean, then I thought to myself, could you imagine if they were around when he talked to the woman at the well? 
Good night. Violations all over the place. First of all, he's talking to a woman. Mercy. And a Samaritan woman yet? A half-breed? Dog? That's what the Jews thought of him. He married five times. Living with a man who's not her husband. I just wonder if any synagogue ruler ever let her into the synagogue, even if she wanted to repent. Defiled. It's condemnation first. It's condemnation first. Jesus had another mission. Loves, accepts, pursues repentant sinners so that he can save them and transform them. I mean, think about it. Isn't it beautiful that he purposefully went after Matthew? That he purposefully went after the woman at the well? And then what happens? They're changed. They're saved. And they're changed. Radically different. Matthew is a changed man after this. The woman at the well, do you remember what she did? She ran back into town. You got to meet this guy who told me everything I've ever done. We know he's the Messiah. Gang, this is the power of the gospel. This is the power of the gospel. This is why we want to bring people to the Lord Jesus. We don't want to go out there and condemn right away. Condemn, condemn, condemn. We miss the gospel, the heart of the gospel. One commentator said, Jesus first loved Matthew, then he transformed him. It's the way of Jesus first to offer loving acceptance, then loving transformation. The Pharisees were oblivious to this, totally oblivious. In their eyes, they weren't sinners who needed a Savior to save them from their sins, transform them from the inside out. They observed all the religious traditions. They wore the proper clothing. You know this, to wash their hands, the proper way you wash your pots and pans somehow i don't even know how they even got there how does that work you think god cares about how clean your dishes are i mean i know there's a lot of stuff in the old testament but that's really what you're going to focus on didn't give a rip about the sin that was in their lives it's religion without repentance it's religion without repentance that's why they could say god i'm glad i'm not like that other guy Extortion or unjust, adulterers, a fast, a give. It's not what makes you a sinner, Jesus. Forget about what you said in the Sermon on the Mount about lusting or murder or telling the truth. I fast and I give. Gang, we got to be careful of that. We got to be careful of that. This mentality that I've been a pretty decent guy my whole life, I've never committed any of the big sins, never did drugs. Commit adultery, maybe cussed a little bit, but not like the other guys did. No, I, mean, I went to church every Sunday. I made an honest living. I took care of my family, but not like the other guy who cheated on his wife. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. If we fall at, into that mentality, we will be legalist Pharisees who love to judge and condemn other people for their sinful living instead of coming alongside of them as a fellow sinner. And leading them to the Savior who saved us. Amen. This is what Matthew's doing. This is what he's trying to emphasize and point out. And so Jesus, he has something to say to these guys. Wonderful biblical truth. It's an illustration from the medical world. It's just brilliant. He shows them that a sick person needs a doctor. And I'm here as the doctor who is willing to help them out when you're not. Verse 12, when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. It's simple enough, right? I, I, the first thought that came to my mind was, you're not going to find doctors hanging out in a running trail with all the people just blazing by you because they're, they're pretty much healthy. The doctor, he's at the hospital. He's at the hospital where he's needed to treat the sick people who come in to see him for healing. Sick people need a physician. I mean, could you imagine how ludicrous this would be? A doctor saying, I can't work here at the hospital anymore. You're all sick. I need to be with the healthy people in the world. I mean, that makes no sense. And so here, I think, are the two spiritual applications that Jesus is making and rebuking the Pharisees for with this comment. Number one, you guys see yourself as the spiritually healthy ones before God, and they really weren't. You know that, right? Yeah. And the tax collectors and the sinners 
They're the spiritually sick before God. Here's the second application. You are doing nothing to help them. You are doing nothing to help them. This is far different what I'm doing versus what you're doing. It's just condemning them and not helping them to repent of their sin, get right with God, and become spiritually healthy. This is what Jesus is after, but they don't see it. They think he is just coming alongside of them and associating with them and leaving them sick. It's dead wrong. It's dead wrong. Jesus acknowledges they are sick and they need a physician. And I'm, I'm going to tell you again, this is why the world and the unbiblical churches who are not truly saved totally, totally misunderstand Jesus in this passage. They think The same thing the Pharisees do. He just eats with them, which he does. He just loves them, which he does. He just accepts them, which he does. But they are dead wrong in saying that he does all of those things without calling them to repentance and faith so that he can save them from their sins and transform their lives. They leave that totally out. Jesus loves everybody just as they are, accepts them into the family of God without dealing with their sickness. That is not the gospel. That's not Jesus. That's not his love. Now we can learn a lot from him and actually love those people out there who seem unlovable and take the gospel to them. But we have to help them. We have to preach the gospel to them. Listen, a good doctor who cares about you is not going to tell you that you're sick with cancer and not do anything to help, right? Right? A good doctor is going to tell you, you're sick. You're sick. I'm going to come alongside of you. We've got a treatment plan, and we're going to go after this thing. I want to try to help you. That's a good doctor. That's Jesus. So they're not willing to help, and I think this is why he does what he does next. He basically tells them, go study your Bible, would you? Look at verse 13. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. You religious experts in the Old Testament law, I mean, I I feel like this is a, a challenge. Rabbi to rabbi. Go and study the Old Testament and learn what it means in Hosea 6, 6. When I said... I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. A little different, but the Hebrew word's the same. Love, mercy, love, mercy. I desire love. I desire mercy, not sacrifices. You know what the Pharisees were all about. The sacrifices, the check boxes, going through the motions without repentance, religious rituals, and zero mercy for people. Zero mercy. For people who were sick with sin. And Jesus has the most harshest words for these people in the Bible. He calls them hypocrites. We're going to get, oh, we're going to get to Matthew 23. Hypocrite, you hypocrite, you hypocrite, you hypocrite. That thinks you're okay with God when you're not. You never repented of your own sin. And all you do is condemn. So he did not come to call them, which is where he's going to end, but to call sinners to repentance and faith. Now, you know how I've said to you over and over again, read your Bible carefully and slowly. I did not come. I did not come. That's huge to me. You want to know why? He's not talking about coming from Capernaum. He's talking about coming from heaven. I came from heaven as the Son of God, not to call The righteous, those of you who think you're righteous when you're not. You don't need me. I came to call sinners. Sinners. Luke, actually, in his account. You see, we talk about repentance and faith because it's two sides of the same coin. In Luke's account, when he quotes this, Jesus says, I've come to call sinners to repentance. Repentance. That includes a change of mind, just like we saw in Matthew. I'm leaving this corrupting, 
tax-collecting lifestyle, and I'm turning, and I'm following him. I'm going after him, believing he is who he says he is. And then one man brought this out in chapter 20. Jesus is going to tell us how he's going to take care of this sin problem. For he did not come into the world to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He's going to die for Matthew. He's going to die for us. He's going to die for the woman at the well. He is going to take our sins upon himself, and you know the glorious, beautiful gospel, and pay the price, the penalty that we all deserve to pay for all of eternity in hell, where we absorb the wrath of God for the stuff we have committed against him. But Jesus said, God, put their sins on me and punish me instead in their place. Praise him. Praise him. So as we apply this, wrap this up, let's be clear about two things. Number one, we are all sinners who have fallen short of the glory of God. Desperate need of a Savior who is Jesus Christ, the Lord, who has come into the world to save sinners. It's beautiful, isn't it? Have you answered a lot of you have. Follow me. A lot of you have answered. Is there anybody sitting in here who needs to answer that call? Follow me. He's saying that right now, I believe, through my words based off the Scripture. Follow me. Follow me. Secondly, let's not be like the Pharisees toward the unbelievers in the world. and Condemn them right away without loving the first associating with them and engaging with them, along with calling them to repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. Gang, it's not love to leave them in their sin to perish for all of eternity. That's not loving. So let's preach the gospel to them. During the benediction, I... I, I'm praying about this because I know it's a very tender subject, something that just blew up in the evangelical world that I think relates to the difference between engaging and affirming. And so now that I've said that, I probably have to bring it up. Um, but it's a very tender issue, so, so be ready for it, pray about it, and uh, I'll talk about it in a benediction because I think this passage lends to it. So let's pray together. Father, we, we come before you, and Father... You had every right to condemn us over and over. You told Adam and Eve in the garden, the day you eat of that fruit, you will die. That could have been it. Died spiritually, died physically, done, no more. But even then, you provided a garment for them to wear. That, to me, says you were going to send somebody, the seed of a woman, to crush the head of the serpent, to take our sins away, to redeem us, and I thank you for your mercy that none of us in here deserves, but you, oh, you in your kind and your tender heart, just as we see in the Lord Jesus, came to seek and to save the lost, anybody who repents of their sin and turns. So I thank you for that. Thank you for such a great salvation. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you that you do desire mercy and not sacrifice. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able, you can stand and sing with us, and, and as we prepare to sing, I want to finish the passage we read earlier um, during the song time in John chapter 13. When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So as we sing of his mercy, may we grow in mercy to each other and to sinners everywhere. So let's sing. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more stronger than darkness, new every morn. 
Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Let's sing it to Him, Your mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, Your mercy is more. for his mercy. Amen. And I want you to hear me loud and clear before I get into this next topic, that we are to have mercy toward sinners just like he showed mercy toward us. But I want to bring up a, a tender issue that just kind of came into the limelight in the evangelical world. I'm not sure you have heard of what's going on with Alistair Begg. Have anybody heard what's going on with Alistair 
I'm not bashing that man at all. What a faithful preacher of God's truth for 40 years. And I would never say don't listen to him anymore. Some people are saying that. I wouldn't say that. It has to do with um, some advice that he gave to his congregant that asked him about attending a transgender wedding. That's why I bring this up. Not Again, not to bash him, not to bash maybe, maybe some of you have a different conviction. You, you've gone already. Praise God for Jesus' blood. Amen. Praise him for his blood. But I think if I'm going to be a faithful pastor and a faithful shepherd, I should probably share with you what I would say. Don't you think? And if, and if you want to dis- if you want to talk about this further, I would be more than happy to sit down with anybody who's wrestling with this question because I've been asked this question. Pastor, should I go to my son or my daughter's gay wedding or transgender wedding? And I can't imagine. Can you imagine how hard that is for a parent, for a grandparent? I think this was a grandparent that was asking the question. And I bring it up because people use this text to um, kind of support what Alistair Begg said to the grandmother. He had said, I I think you should go. Just make sure that um, they know where you stand. And and I've heard this before. And even take them a gift. Um, And so he's he's gotten a lot of backlash about that. He's convicted. That's what he would continue to tell folks. Um, Just make sure, again, make sure they know where you stand. Um, I don't think I would give that advice. A lot of other folks are are talking with him now. I think I would give the advice of there are many, many other ways that you could engage and love on. But to attend a marriage like that, I would be uncomfortable attending because, as you know, at a marriage ceremony, you, it's always been seen that your presence there is affirming in some way and supporting in some way, witnessing in some way. So I would, I would caution against that. And I say that because that's not a wedding in God's eyes. God created marriage between a man and a woman. Anything outside of that, not only is it against his moral law, it's against his natural law. And so, unless you're going to go and you're going to raise your hand, which I don't think they do that anymore. Remember, they used to say that. Does anybody have any objections? I don't think they do that anymore. That would be my, that would be my counsel. You can love them in a million other ways, but to do that, I, I just don't see Jesus going and and being present there, even if the couple knew where you stood, what about all the other folks? And so, that again, that's where I'm at. I, I kind of liken it to we don't get together and celebrate adultery. We don't get together and celebrate murder. Um, this is an egregious thing before the Lord. So, um, But again, you're going to have to wrestle with it. I don't. I love Alistair's evangel- evangelistic bent. He just wants to keep building that bridge to which I say, amen. You're just going to have to pray through the applications and and know where those lines are for you. Is that fair? All right. Father, we do thank you. Help us to be like Jesus himself, to have his mind and his heart. He came after us when we were lost. We were dead in our sin. And even you granted the drawing and the repentance and the faith And we're so thankful for that. We're so thankful, Jesus, that you died for our sin. Lord, you died for tax collectors. You died for liars. You died for trans folks. You died for homosexuals. You died for heterosexual sin. You died for gossip. And we're so grateful. We're so grateful that you're a friend of sinners. So thank you. And help us to have your heart in your mind as we engage the lost of this world who are sick. They are sick and they need a Savior. Thank you for being that friend of sinners and all of God's people said, amen. Love you. See you next week.
today. If you have any questions about this, 